The way to think differently is to act differently and get comfortable with being uncomfortable. Welcome to the Unlearn Podcast, where host Barry O'Reilly seeks to synthesize the superpowers of extraordinary individuals into actionable strategies you can use to think big, start small, and learn fast, and find your edge with excellence. Here's your host, Barry O'Reilly. Ken Beck, welcome to the show. Thank you, Barry. Thanks for uh, being on the show. It's a real pleasure to have you here. Well, we're about to find out. <laughs> Right. So, you know, one of the things that was super exciting for me to have you on the show was we met in Australia. Yeah. I was talking about Unlearn. You know, you were interested enough to find out a little bit more about it. But before we dive into that, why don't you share a little bit about yourself? Oh, so, and that reminds me, I need to get you to sign my copy. Okay, I'll definitely sign it. That, oh, that's, that's a pleasure for me. <laughs> so tell us a little bit about yourself. Like, what's your backstory? What, what brought you to where you are today? Well, that's a pretty broad question. Uh, I'm I'm a third generation geek. So my my grandfather was a radio geek. Uh, my dad was an electrical engineer. Uh, moved to Silicon Valley uh, just before I was born in 1961. Wow, it wasn't even Silicon Valley then. What what was it then? It was still it was still mainly it was the Valley of the Heart's Delight. Oh, nice. Lots and lots of prune orchards. <laughs> lots of apricots. I grew up in a in a cherry orchard, uh, oh. cherry trees around. Sounds lovely. Yeah, so that was, it was a very different, very so, different world. Back sounds then. like what they're trying to create in the Apple building at the moment, really. Yeah, and they could have just not torn it down in the first place and <laughs> saved everybody a bunch of time. But no, that was not one of the options. So my dad was a, a, an electrical engineer, uh, uh, worked in uh, aviation kind of stuff, and then when microprocessors processors came out he saw the writing on the wall and and learned how to program i mean he was a really smart guy and a great engineer so that was not a big stretch for him yeah and uh so i grew up around computers we we built our first personal computer together you know soldering stuff father and son yada 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 yeah what, what great memories to have i imagine yeah yeah and uh so it was very natural for me to go into programming. But it, as you can see here, I, I also have a lovely brace of guitars. And music was always my other main passion. So it was kind of a, a nip and tuck which one I would end up with. In college, uh, I took every other year as a music student and a computer science student. Interesting. So what, what did you learn from either one of those fields that you could sort of incorporate hmm. into your being, I suppose? Well, I think the, the music taught me how to express myself uh, without uh, without a lot of editing, without a lot of shame. Just like, okay, here's what I'm feeling at this moment. I'm just going to put it out there, and people can listen to it. And it's it's scary at first. Like uh, you know, somebody could look at you and say, "Oh no, you know, what you're feeling is just awful." But you know, in fact, people don't tend to do that. And if they do, well tell with them so (laughs) um yeah so through uh graduated with bachelor's and master's in computer science um and also did my senior recital in classical guitar and uh built a family and uh went on from there i think most people are obviously synonymous with you in the technology world right you Mm -hmm. were one of creators of extreme programming wrote one of the sort of seminal books on that Signer of the mythical Agile Manifesto. So no, no, no. I'm not just a sign. I'm the first signer. Even nicer. Yeah, yeah. alphabetically. <laughs> <laughs> but it is Beck et al., which you know leaves me with no end of pleasure. That was good. 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 Good way to engineer that. I'm That's sure. right. Yeah. So you know, I think it's it's great for people to hear a little bit about uh, that about you. But you know, I, I think um, one of the things that uh, you know when I was getting ready to talk to you and I was looking at what you're currently doing now I really liked your sort of mission statement Mm -hmm. where you had this idea of help geeks feel safe in the world yeah so as a third generation geek you know how how are you helping the fourth generation Uh, um well so that phrase helping geeks feel safe in the world 
uh, came about about 25 years into my career. I, I talked to lots of young engineers because they're all young engineers compared to me now. And they say, well, you know, I want to have, you know, what's my mission? What's my purpose? I'm like, you're, you're nowhere near close to finding that out. You just need to follow your impulses, the good ones, do the things that make sense for you to do. And then you can come back later and connect the dots. And so that's what I did about 25 years into my career. I looked back and I said, what, what is the thread that runs through patterns, uh, programmer testing, XP, um, uh, the, uh, you know, the, the TDD test driven development. What, what, what like ties all those together? And I don't know, I don't remember the exact moment, but that phrase popped into my, into my head that, uh, uh, being uh, someone of the geeky sort of persuasion, oftentimes the world is a confusing, inexplicable, feels like an unsafe place. Um, and so the work I've done on myself, you know, I, I've published a fair amount of stuff about uh, becoming more aware of my own emotions and being able to express them and deal with them in, in productive ways. Like that's part of feeling safe there there are times when i'm actually safe in a situation like uh at a cocktail party when when there there's no external threat and yet i feel very afraid yeah so learning to feel safe in that situation is part of it there's a flip side which is as a geek there there are times when i'm i'm actually not acting safe like putting stuff into production and then going off on vacation that's not safe And I shouldn't feel safe in that situation. I should prepare, like by writing plenty of tests and being able to justify my confidence so that I can put code into production, feel safe, and actually be safe. So there's there's both sides of it. One side is, hey, things aren't as scary. If things feel scarier than they need to feel, and then there's the, hey, sometimes things should feel scary, and if you don't, if you're not scared, then when they blow up, when that situation blows up, you're going to really be terrified. Like, oh, I, I thought everything was fine. and So th- this is super interesting to me, right? Because a, a lot of these are sort of aha moments, I'm sure, that you discovered from doing your work, from living your life, yeah. right? there. Uh, and I, I'm always searching for these great sort of unlearning moments in, mm-hmm. in, in people's lives. Like, what, what helped you realize that... In a technical environment, you needed to create countermeasures to make what you're doing safe. Just like uh, as you're describing, you know, being yourself and being in situations where it's maybe uncomfortable or feels outside your comfort zone. And mm-hmm. how do you make those feel safe? Mm-hmm. What, what would be some of the sort of moments that sort of jump out to you that you maybe had to learn, but also unlearn as you went through those paths? So the, the first maybe five years of my professional career, no, maybe more than that, eight, even 10 years of my professional career, I try, I figured if I just become a better programmer, my projects are going to do better. Yeah, of course. Yeah. Just work harder, work longer, uh, read memorize more, more APIs, yeah. get uh, re- memorize more IDE shortcuts. Like yeah. I, I wanted to become a virtuoso programmer. Yeah. Um, and then uh, early on in my consulting career, I went to do some performance tuning work at a, a company in Chicago. And it was this was when I was a full-time small talk programmer. Oh yeah, great. Yeah. And what I, the what I noticed was the the project was staffed by the four most senior engineers. And because they were the senior engineers, they had the corner offices in the building. Of course. And so it was really hard for them to communicate because they had these corner offices. And, um, and I told them, uh, you know what, you should find a space where you can get together to work. And the only space that they had available was the machine room back when there were machine rooms. I came back a month later, the project was on track, people were happy with how things were going, and they had spent the entire month in their down coats in this refrigerated <laughs> machine room working for hours and hours every day and loving it on the flight. I can remember very clearly on the flight, on the way home from that second visit, I thought, 
I have this wealth of technical knowledge. But what I told them that was really valuable was to rearrange the furniture. I thought, oh, wow. So there's a there's an unlearning moment for you. I you know, I thought knowing the virtual machine and the garbage collector parameter, nah, no, they just they were sitting the wrong place. I, I told them to, to, to change where they were sitting, and that was the most valuable thing. That was a real wake-up call for me. Like, that's the beginning of the course change that led to extreme programming. So, so let's dive into a little bit more of that, right? So, you know, I'm sure you weren't sitting at home one day, and then suddenly this perfect model of what extreme programming no, no. would be came into being in your head, right? Like, you, you would have had to try things. Yep. Things that work, didn't work, saw other things. Like you described at this um, fridge factory coding unit from the corner offices. You know, so how, how did you sort of work your way into finding XP? And, and what were some more of the things that you also had to learn, but also unlearn about what you thought you had to do to get there? So uh, another unlearning moment was uh, uh, I thought that the, the, the conventional wisdom, which I just took at face value, was that uh, uh, programmers couldn't test their own code, couldn't even be trusted to test their own code, right? That was the conventional wisdom. And uh, so I'd been experimenting with uh, ways of writing automated tests for for quite a long time. Uh, n- Nothing really coalesced for me. And then I was uh, going to visit a different uh, client in Chicago. And I knew that I was going to tell them to write tests because I kind of, I kind of, the glimmerings had come that it was important for programmers to write their own tests for their own purposes, like because it selfishly benefits me as a programmer if I write automated tests. And I'd done a bunch of experiments. I knew I was going to tell them to. But I didn't have a, a, a how. So uh, uh, just the night before I left, I thought, how am I going to tell them? Let, let me just bang out a little framework that will let them write and run tests. What should it be? Da, 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 da. And uh, about uh, 20 functions and three classes later i had x unit yeah which the first version was in small talk yeah which then a few years later was uh, eric yam and i transliterated in a, in a java and has since been copied by a, a bunch of people but there was there the first part was definitely rejecting that oh the qa department you know don't worry about if you make mistakes qa department's going to handle it and I realized, no, nah, it's just for a bunch of reasons. You know, I find that patronizing. Uh, it doesn't af- align authority and responsibility. Like if I can make a mistake, I should be the one who fa- finds it and fixes it. Well, what's really interesting for me is a lot of these ideas would be extremely counterintuitive and, and almost uh, you would be a heretic at that time to be saying, you know, why... Why would engineers write their own code? We have testing departments. That's the way we've always right. done things around here. Right. Um, but what's also interesting to me is that you, by writing these tests, you're sort of starting to introduce these ideas of safety mm-hmm. in the way that you actually even build your code. Right. That you're finding out quickly that you're making something that could break, that might not be what you want it to be, and pushing that onto other people for responsibility. So there's some interesting sort of threads there mm-hmm. as you sort of start to unpack these things. But what were sort of the next steps then after you started to recognize this tools that could help you learn fast what worked, what didn't, allow developers to sort of unlearn their behavior, relearn new ways of doing things, what worked, what didn't, and help them get breakthroughs in the software that they were building? Well, the the origins of... Uh, extreme as a brand name came from watching people following the conventional wisdom at that time which was very waterfall oriented Mm -hmm. uh very slow feedback cycles very large batch sizes um and just thinking now this can't be right i see people drawing diagram after diagram after diagram well what if the first diagram is wrong well they're not going to know 
not for a very long time, if ever, whether they made a mistake or not. And that just can't be, can't be right. Um, so when I had the chance to, uh, give advice to a project as a whole, how are we going to turn this project around? This is the, the C3 Chrysler payroll project. Right. Um, I just decided, well, I don't have anything to lose. So I may take the, may as well take the things that I know are valuable about, about programming, which is a programming, building relationships with somebody who knows the problem to be solved, even if they don't know how to solve it, um, uh, designing as you go along, releasing interim uh, uh, versions of the product to get real feedback from real users about real applications. Like all that stuff I know is good. So let's crank that up and we'll take this whole laundry list of, and you should be writing this diagram and the blah, 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 blah. And you should organize. I'm just going to throw that all away and see what happens. And it turns out if you have a, a, a richly connected social structure and short feedback loops, uh, the rest of it pretty much takes care of itself. And um, it was a shock to lots of people. Now, you, you said uh, I sound like a heretic. I am a heretic, but I'm always a heretic. So I, I've just stopped feeling bad about that. <laughs> Right, but I th I think you know the the spirit of that is that you're willing to explore uncertainty, you're you're willing to try new things to get there. You're actively putting yourself outside your comfort zone to sort of get these breakthroughs, right? And and that's a deliberate choice. And I think sometimes people they wonder like, how do you get these epiphanies? How do you how do you really innovate? And recognizing that part of it is putting yourself in the situation to allow that to happen being comfortable with being uncomfortable, being courageous to try some of these things. No, but, okay, okay. So I, I get accused of courage often. It's absolutely not true. I am clueless about it. If, if I go into the, into the, the uh, board of directors and I tell them to cancel a product, project because it'll never be successful, it's not a courageous move on my part that I just think that's the best thing to do. If, if I say uh, to a programmer, you know, you should write tests. It doesn't take courage on my part. It's just obvious. And I'm clueless enough to just blast ahead. And I have no idea, uh, uh, you know, what the fallout of that's going to be. It's just obvious to me. So, you, and you used another word, innovative, in, in, in like innovative ideas. None of the ideas that I've had that other people label as innovative were innovative to me. They were just the obvious way to do things. So what's... How do people start to understand how you're doing that? Because one of the things that's interesting to me then is if you sort of have this, let's call it even a bias for action to try things, yep. you're also putting in countermeasures to help you learn if the things you're trying are working or not. Yep. So working in these sort of small cycles means that you're trying things, you're getting results, which is new information that helps you adapt what you're going to do next. Yeah. So there's really a system yeah, about, yeah, about what you're doing to explore uncertainty. Absolutely. So, yeah. okay. So uh, uh, I have some habits that really help. One habit is, uh, is to reverse any sentence that begins with obviously. Just if somebody said, well, obviously programmers can't be t uh, trusted to write their own tests. I just, I automatically, I'm just a perverse bastard. I automatically think, what if that's not true? Like what, what, what's the implication of that not being true? That's step one. And step two is, can we try this easily, cheaply? So a uh, very recent, like months ago example, I was giving a training at, uh, at Iterate, which is a, a, a small innovation consultancy in, in uh, Oslo. Uh, and I showed them this little workflow that I've been using for years where you run the tests and there's a programming workflow. You run the tests. If they pass, you make a commit. So you know you can always get back. If you get lost, you can always get back to green. Um, and one of the students, Admin Struma, said, well, by symmetry, if you commit when the tests pass, you should revert when the tests fail. You should go back, just automatically go back to green. I thought, this is a terrible idea. This is going to be awful. Because like you're going to make a change. 
you'll break something and then your change is just going to disappear. And I thought, I hate this idea, but it is so easy to try that we have to try it. I think people make the mistake of, of looking for good ideas. Uh, and if, if a good idea turns out to be good, so what? Right? It was a good idea. It's when a bad idea turns out not to be a bad idea, then that's really interesting. Because you don't have any competition, right? Nobody else is dumb enough to try this. So you're out ahead of the pack just through sheer perversity. And yes, you have to throw away a hundred ideas that are bad that turn out to be bad in the interim. But okay, that's just the price you pay. Well, well one of my favorite quotes uh, from Lewis Pauling is this idea of in order to have good ideas, you have to have lots of ideas. And really this method to cycle through ideas as quickly as possible to find out which are good, which are duds, or which give new information, unexpected information that opens up another thread for you to follow. That's super interesting. But it sounds like, you know, this thinking, even what you're describing here now has evolved from your early days of working in software where there was no feedback mechanisms and inspiring TDD. And now you're thinking even beyond that, that this idea of just executing things and seeing the results and then based on achieving what you expected or not, killing things early that that aren't working and following the threads that are working and diving into them to see where they go. Mm -hmm. Like that's a method to explore uncertainty, especially in complex environments that we work in, like software, like building new products. Like, so this is, it's really interesting for me to sort of make systematize essentially your exploration of uncertainty and the tools and the mechanisms that you're naturally putting in place okay so here's another one yeah which is uh if somebody introduces a new model to me i i say to myself uh what would happen if i just acted like this model was true so i read unlearn i say okay and Barry, I'm no offense in, well, I mean, I told you, I don't know whether it's going to offend or not. You should see his face right now, by the way, dear listeners. Um, I, I read Unlearn and, and it's, I, I wanted it to be much more scientific. Um, and it, it, so the, it's kind of a good news, bad news book for me. The, the, the bad news is it, it, it doesn't, doesn't speak to the scientist in me. And, and it's very easy for me to dismiss kind of the, the, the voice of it in the language, like, oh, God, come on, man. You know, don't tell me about reprogramming neural pathways. Like, but without, unless you show me a picture of a neuron, I don't want to hear that stuff. So that's the bad news. The good news is the book works. My behavior, I, you know, I'm reading it. I'm like, oh, God, Barry, would you please? Uh, and then I'm watching my behavior and my behavior is changing. I am unlearning things and relearning things in the, you know, but it's a great example of this. What if I doesn't matter whether I believe this model, what matters is if this model was true, what would be true next? Oh, well, I'd have to unlearn some things. Well, what would I have to unlearn? Well, you know, in my case right now, January, 2019, I kind of had this fairly entitled, uh, hey, I I don't need to go find work. Work will come find me. You know, I spent seven years inside of Facebook. I didn't have to worry about where the next paycheck was coming from. It's been a year since then. I kind of like, well, something's going to work out. Well, no, I needed to unlearn that kind, that sense of entitlement. And your book did a beautiful job of leading me through that to say, okay, well, I have to question what I'm doing. I do this same kind of process with with lots of different models. So I read about uh, uh, Black Swan and yeah. I think, well, okay, I, whether it's true or not, it's irrelevant. What would I do based on on this model? Or I read something, uh, something in a, a Buddhist text about detachment. And I don't think, do I believe this or not? I just think, how would I act if I was detached in this moment? You know, or or here's a meditation practice. I don't think is this a good one. I I need to try it. There's I can't tell. So anytime I encounter a new model, at least mentally, I try it out and say, if this model was true, then I would do X. You know, a real options theory. 
Yep. Another example, how do I create more, you know, options have value. How, how do I create options in my life? Oh, well, I would do this and this and this. Oh, well, let me just try those things. I'm not going to prejudge whether they, I think they're going to work or not. As long as it's cheap to try it, I'm just going to try it, see what happens. And then, uh, I'll learn something either. I'll learn while well, I didn't understand the model or I don't, I, this model isn't helpful to me or I'll find out something that's completely new. Yeah. And I, I think again, what, what's super interesting, what you're describing is that you do try mm -hmm. Have to. You, you'll run the experiment and you'll, you'll let the data decide. Right. And that's really, I guess, this, this science side of you sort of coming to fruition, right? right? You're what might, you might be an intuitive experimenter. It's just the way you're built, right? You, you see the hypothesis, you see, you design the experiment, you run and find out for yourself and, um, and how that's manifested both in the way you build software with software, a solution being a hypothesis and writing code and experiment to test that and mm -hmm. having mechanisms in place to give you feedback quickly about whether the experiment results are validating or invalidating your hypothesis, building tools to make that cheaper, building systems of work to sort of catify this intuitive process to you is being like the, that has impact in the industry because people are learning how to experiment and explore uncertainty in a systematic manner. Mm -hmm. And I think that's one of the things that's quite interesting to me, at least about the, the work you've been doing and, and also how your thought process has evolved from your early days of inventing XP to obviously your time in Facebook and, and this example, you're talking about this test commit rollback. Can you elaborate a little bit more on how you're thinking, your thinking has sort of, you've almost had to be a heretic to yourself to a certain extent of the principles of test driven development. And now you're saying, well, maybe there's a, another way to do this, which is part of a little bit of a learning and unlearning journey. So what were, what were some of the signals that made you realize that maybe this test code commit approach was something that had got legs that was worth exploring. So it, it didn't, it didn't come up in a vacuum. I knew that I wanted I, I, for a, quite a while. I've been disenchanted with the, the asynchronous blocking code review where I make some changes. I send them to your queue. At some point in the future, I nothing. I can't do anything with the changes I made until you pull it off of your queue. You make some comments, put your thumbprint on it. It comes back to me, and now I can put it in production. That process creates value, no question about it. Mm -hmm. um, but it also creates a lot of systemic costs. It creates a lot of uh, uh, wait time, uh, which people respond to in different ways, some by twiddling their thumbs, others by multitasking or by going forward with the project, assuming that you're going to rubber stamp my changes. And then some change, and then you say, no, 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 this isn't right. Now I not only have to change the thing that I did, I have to change the thing that I did after the thing that I did. And the thing after that, and I just thought, oh, this is, there's so much cost to this. So, uh, uh, this is another one of my tricks, which is looking further forward. Like the, at, at Facebook, we went from 700 engineers when I got there in 2011 to 5,000 engineers when I left in 2018. There were a lot of people working on the 10,000 engineer problem. So that's not interesting to me. I'm interested in the 100,000 engineer problem. So this is just a, one of these tricks yeah. where, and I, I learned this from Bill Joy, just if there's some trend line and people are looking at the next step in the trend line, you just go like six steps further. Yeah. And it, again, you don't question it. Not at first. You don't think, well, would it make sense to have a hundred thousand people working on the same software system? Who cares? I just, I draw the line, do the math, I hold my nose and I say, yep. How are we going to get to a hundred thousand people? The overheads of this asynchronous blocking code review model just become enormous. Like yeah, it's the a, whole it's thing exponential cost at that stage. The, the one thing we know is the smaller changes are, the easier they are to get through. And this goes back to like lean manufacturing, smaller batches, 
closer to flow. So I thought, uh, how can we take, and this is again, the, that extreme kind of model, uh, what's the smallest possible change that I can confidently make? And, uh, that gave birth to this, this hypothetical system I call limbo because the limbo song asks, how low can you go? <laughs> and so how small can we make changes and how quickly can we propagate them? How far? So I knew I was looking for a source of little safe changes. So when TCR came up, like I was, I was in that same general area. And when, when Oddmund, my, my student came up with this idea, like the, the light went on, Hey, if this works, this is not going to work, right? This is a stupid idea. Let's be clear. But if it works, it becomes a source of small, safe changes. Because when you're working in test commit revert style, the last thing you want to do is write 20 lines of code, run the tests, poof, it's gone. So you, the incentive structure is how can I make this big change in smaller steps? Now I've been a small step guy for 25, 30 years. Now that I'm programming TCR every day, I have to, the, no, I was not, I was making gigantic change. I might change eight lines of code at one time. Like how stupid is that? I have to figure out how can I change one line and then one more line and then one more line and then another, ha, and then that whole change that I was imagining is in place. Well, as soon as I, we had a source of small, safe changes, this limbo vision suddenly like, duh, of course. So if I make a little change to the program, it can be reflected in your code instantly because yep. it's a small change and it's safe. Well, not just you, your code. It can be, we can push that to production. So the, the limbo uh, mental model is these tiny changes get propagated everywhere to a, a billion smartphones in a billion pockets a million times a day, conceptually. So everybody's on the same page all the time. So the, the kind of merge conflicts where you go change something and I change the same thing in some incompatible way, it, it just doesn't happen because you're in the middle of making your incompatible change, poof, it just disappears because I've made a safe change. It gets pushed to your machine. What you're working on just disappears. It doesn't happen very often, but if it's going to happen, you'd rather have it happen before you've finished making your change, not, a, you know, a day later when the, when your code review gets finished and my code review gets finished and the blah, blah, oh God, why yeah. would you wait that long? Well, I, th I think there's a few things to really underline here. Like one of the things we talk a lot about is think big, start small. And I always think that small is way, way smaller than people think. Yep. So to hear that you're almost atomizing your changes to allow this experimentation, to allow these feedback loops to happen at almost atomic scale. Mm -hmm. Super interesting to explore uncertainty. Every time I think I've found atomic scale, there's another scale below it that's even smaller. Great. You know, and, and the side effect of that is it allows you to have this continuously evolving system. Mm-hmm that there aren't wait times, that people aren't having a uh, their mental model of how the system exists being very different, legacy, outdated, because the system's constantly updating. Mm -hmm. And you're tuning into that constantly updating system in near real time. Yeah, we're talking at two levels here. At one level, we're talking about a software development process of tiny changes instantly propagated so that the, the system we're talking about is the software system. But g coming back to what we were talking about earlier, we're also talking about uh, uh, th these quote unquote innovative, quote unquote courageous thoughts where the, the you don't bother judging an idea, the value of an idea. You take an idea and if you can find a way to experiment with it, and this is true in music. We're both musicians. Mm. It's true in in um, uh, uh, business development. We're both independent business people. It's it's true in uh, writing. In like, if you can find a way to 
just try an idea cheaply, just do that. And so like Twitter, I think you use Twitter in a similar kind of way. I don't know. I know that one tweet is going to be way more popular than the next hundred, but I don't know which. So my best strategy is as long as it's not illegal or immoral, I'm just going to put the tweet out there because the one that blows up is going to be a complete surprise to me. And if, if there's one, I think oh, this is not going to be the one. And then I don't publish it. The chances that I've just killed that massively successful tweet go way, way up. So uh, I use Twitter to find out what people are interested in hearing me talk about. Cause I, I don't know. And I don't want to make assumptions. I want to put, I got a bunch of ideas in my head at any given time, as you may have noticed by now, I want to put them out there equally and see what people respond to. Yeah. I think that's one of the interesting thing about all these platforms, right? There are ways to just constantly test and experiment. Right. Like one of the ways I've used Twitter to launch a business is quite fun. I had um, a belief that um, people who took photos of bottles of wine mm -hmm. potentially probably want, would buy that bottle of wine. Mm -hmm. But normally when people take photos of bottles of wine, when do you do that? Uh, hmm. Like at a dinner? I don't know what's that. Right. And oh. then the next morning, do you remember the name of the bottle of wine? Yeah, I might not remember the dinner. Even better, right? <laughs> yeah. So what we found was... Um, the belief was if people took a photo of a bottle of wine, they probably want to buy that bottle of wine. Mm -hmm. Now, the easiest way for us to test that was simply to go onto Twitter, search for people who had taken photos of bottles of wine, send them a customized tweet that said, would you like to buy two bottles of Chaton Rouge? Mm -hmm. If so, click this link, basically on the, the photo that they had taken. How many people do you think clicked on that link when we sent them that tweet? As a percentage? Yeah, of course. I, 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 don't, I don't guess it then. 80. 80%? I, huge uptake. Wow. Right? And what we would say is we'd ah. deliver you two bottles of this wine the next day. Now, that was a great signal for us to start experimenting yeah. with people to understand what worked, what didn't, and using a lot of these platforms but, but wait, to wait, test wait. information. No, you, you, need to, you need to set up your, your multi-region failover load balanced properly web architected come on now you can't you can't skip that kind of work i know that's come my on, Barry. that's my hair tech <laughs> you know and I, I think it's kind of interesting though to you know show how people are using this stuff and one of the most interesting things for me is not only how i or you or anyone is testing their ideas it's also a great source of leaders to understand their beliefs and not of how people are actually using their products. Mm -hmm. One of the examples to talk a lot about in on learn is uh, John Lagarde, who's the CEO of T-Mobile, right? He's constantly on social media. He, he actually actively invites customers to send him feedback about what's working or not working about their products and services and using that way to have a direct feedback loop with customers. Mm -hmm. And then based on their feedback, change their systems of work, change the policies about how they run their company. And not only does it build loyalty with the customers, it also shows vulnerability by the CEO. It also is a really powerful mechanism to sort of cut through all the noise that exists in these large organizations about what should we do? What will make things better? What you think is right? What they think what, is right? But what an inefficient process, right? He should, he should, uh, uh, I'm being facetious. Of course. I, I can do that with you. Yeah, of course. Yeah. I mean, so, you know, you should, you should commission a focus group to go out and do the research and come back with the, uh, the distilled, the, 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 yeah, the bullet lit. Here's the three top priorities that, right? That's the traditional model is, is saying this is about efficiency and a CEO has better things to do than sitting on support calls. Uh, we have people to do that right but they never get the quality of information that they get right than if they do it themselves sure because the the people uh collating and and aggregating that information have completely different incentive structures always <laughs> outsource the work keep the work it's interesting yeah so we we've talked a little bit about you know your coding experience of exploring uncertainty we've talked a little bit about this test commit revert methodology that you've used to 
find out what ideas are by, mm -hmm. by trying, just mm -hmm. constantly trying things to see what works and what doesn't. That's very much part of the relearning process, right? Try as many things as you can to find the right behavior that drives you towards the outcome that you're you're seeking. Mm -hmm. So you have a very explicit step to help you under realize when you've achieved that breakthrough. Mm -hmm. How how do you know that you've achieved that breakthrough? What what are some of the things you set up in your system when you're doing this test commit revert approach to tell you that you should keep committing? So and and this goes back to uh, uh, this question of should programmers write their own tests? A long time ago, I I went counter the opposite to the to the conventional wisdom, and said yes, programmers should write their own tests because I liked it when I wrote my own tests. I liked how that felt. I felt safer, and I should feel safer because it's more likely to be correct. Um, the, there's an art to figuring out what's the minimum. A set of uh, evidence that would convince me that that this is working. So, uh, I've been live streaming some of my TCR sessions, and an example I used was a poker hand evaluator. You know, two pair beats one pair. So, I'm going to write a program that says, "Here's how I'm going to figure out whether I have one pair or not. Here's what, how I'm going to figure out whether I have two pair or not." And I need to come up with examples illustrative examples that drive the that code in the direction that I know that I want it to go. Now that's a that's a personal preference. I like going from concrete examples to more abstract ideas always always have and there are people who are exactly the opposite. They want to state universal principles and then say well in this specific example this is going to work, but I've stated the universal principle first. Uh, potato, potato, and that's fine. Either works. I, I don't put theirs down and I don't allow them to put mine down. It's just two different ways of working. So I do have a sense of, well, I need an example of this, but I don't need an example of that because by induction, I believe that this one's just going to work. So I don't need to put in the effort to demonstrate this works. You know, if, if, uh, if two pair beats one pair in poker, it always beats it. I don't have to list all the possible two pairs and all the possible one pairs and compare each one with each of the... No, that's way, way too many. Yeah. I can just say, well, I wrote this code in this way and I can infer that any possibility, given, given the examples I have and the code I have, I have reasonable confidence that this is going to work no matter what I throw at it. Um, th there's an art to doing that just as there's an art to stating these universal principles that other people drive their programming from. Yeah, it's, it's interesting though, but it feels as well. There's an approach there that you're also starting quite small by describing yes. some small steps that must be true in order to take the next step. And, and not only small, but incomplete. So w one of the, f from back in the day, the way I was taught in school to write programs, they should work from the the first time you run them, they should work perfectly for all inputs. And that was something that I just had to reject from like literally the first computer science lecture I ever went to at the University of Oregon, go Ducks. <laughs> um, I had to say, no, that just doesn't make sense to me. I want to, I want to make a program. If, if I try and solve all the problems all at once, I just get wedged. My brain doesn't handle that kind of complexity all at once. I have to partition the complexity temporally. I'm going to solve this problem today, and there's a whole bunch of problems I'm going to solve tomorrow or in the future, but I'm not going to think about them because I can't think about them all at one time because I have this little tiny brain. There's definitely an art to that, but that is, that's been my approach all along. Because of the way my brain works, I have to accept partial solutions. The amazing thing is how often partial solutions give you, you know, that 10% solution gives you 90% of the value. If you were waiting for the other 90% to be done, you're just sitting there twiddling your thumb. Your customer's sitting there twiddling their thumbs. Their problem's not solved. 
when the complete perfect solution comes out, yeah, now the problems as they understood them way back when are solved, but they had to wait a long time. And in the meantime, their understanding of the problems have all completely changed. I would rather get something out today, get it in front of somebody, watch how they behave, and they're going to surprise me. You know, of the 100 features I'm going to implement in that say we implement a feature a day for the next 100 days, one of those features is going to be much more valuable than the rest of them combined. But I don't know which one. So let's get one out. And then the, the likeliest, we can get the likeliest one out and the next likeliest and the next likely. But we're not very good at guessing which, you know, what the, which uh, a chocolate bar is going to have that golden ticket in it. So we just have to eat all the chocolate bars as quickly as we can. Sounds like fun. Oh, a Willy Wonka reference. I am so proud of myself. Well, you know, I think the the thing to really underline here is it, in so much of your work, your approach to these things is not getting stuck on trying to have the perfect idea. It's having lots of ideas and having a system in place that you can test these ideas as quickly as possible to find out which of the golden ticket and which don't. Yeah. But I think, you know, that what I'm, what I'm trying to say here is that it's a system that allows you to move fast, figure out what works and what doesn't right. in cheap, small, fast ways. E even as an individual with very limited personal resources. Yes. I can still try out a bunch of stuff. Which is great. So you can get started almost with nothing. Yeah. Yeah, the, and the think so. I think there's a there's a side of the think big, start small. There, the think big is important to know that you're trying to achieve this big, maybe irrational thing that sets the stage. I'm not just doing stuff at random. I'm I have some big goals like helping geeks feel safe in the world. That's a direction that I'm going in the strategic sense. Now the little things that I do will fit into that just because I've got that in my mind as that this big thing that I want to achieve for myself and I would love to share with my my uh, 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 geeky siblings around the world um, but then yeah what am I going to do today that's a little bit tiny little bit more like that than what I have now yeah and it's great to hear that you're not only living this in your life but you're living it in your work and it, it's a system that's helped you sort of explore the world which is it's fun to see that that's that's part of you mm -hmm. and and making helping people understand that making what seems intuitive to you explicit to other people i think is always a really helpful thing for people to hear cool so what's next for you you're now uh, playing with this new methodologies that you're discovering yourself. What are you looking forward to now? Or what, what's the next sort of think big or outcome that you're aiming for? Well, on the, uh, I'm very interested in this idea of scaling software collaboration beyond what people think is sensible. Um, there's another, like the perverse part of me also is asking the question, uh, uh, why would you have 100,000 people working on the same system? W what could you do to accomplish that same system with 1,000 people instead of 100,000? That one's in the back of my mind. I'm, I'm even doubting, I, I'm even contradicting myself, and that's fine. I don't mind, you know, I'm used to it. It's part of your process. It is part of my process, absolutely. So, uh, but I, I would like to, to play this out. I would love to find a, a, a patron, somebody who says, yeah, this is a crazy idea, but it's worth investing in. Even if it doesn't work, it's going to spin off really interesting stuff. Because the the constraints, if you say, how are we going to have 100,000 programmers pushing code to production a uh, thousand times a day each? You know, that's something, th those constraints are going to create new technology, new techniques, new social structures to keep that from coherent in some kind of way. So I would love to find a, a, a patron for th that work in, in some kind of form. In the meantime, I'm going to continue working on it myself. I mean, that's, that's we didn't talk about this, but part of my process is that I try out all my ideas on myself first. Then if they seem like they're not stupid, that's my bar. 
<laughs> then I'm going to teach them to people individually, one at a time. And then and only then am I going to start talking about them in public and encouraging the, the kind of the, the wider, the, that exponential spread of an idea. Um, so uh, that's part of what I'm doing. Uh, I've also spent the last year exploring different parts of my, my self, like hey, I'm, uh, me as a musician, me as an artist, um, uh, me as a, a speaking to a business audience instead of a technical audience. There's a degree to which I want to continue those explorations. There's another degree to which I need to find one of them that looks like it it's going to pay off as a way of paying the bills and and make sure that I'm taking care of uh, those basics as I as I go along and continue those crazy explorations as I go as uh, uh, out of my experiences. Yeah, it's great again to hear these things like you're thinking bigs are so big <laughs> but what's exciting about that is to get there you're not going to use the behaviors that you're using today you're going to force yourself to learn new behaviors to unlearn your existing behaviors and relearn new ones to get there and and that's what breeds this constant innovation so where do you get to your hundred thousand developers that's not really the outcome no it's all the breakthrough knowledge the new things that you'll learn along the way that that are super interesting and since you you're such a humble and modest individual i'm going to put the plug in for unlearn <laughs> as a catalyst whether you like reading the book or not my experience is it really is a catalyst for well if this book was true what is it that i would have to unlearn and that really does did for me spur changes in my behavior that i wouldn't have expected given kind of a high level overview of, of this book and the, the sort of uptake you've seen in this book, I think is, is ample evidence that other people are ready for that same kind of experience. Yeah. And it's the inspiration for wanting to talk to people about it. You, you should see this Irish face blush <laughs> beet red as I compliment him. It's just beautiful. We're not, we're not allowed to say nice things about people. I <laughs> So I appreciate it. Thank you. My pleasure. Listen, it's been an absolute joy to have you on, on the podcast. Thank you for being one of the first person to just try this yet again. You and bet. I'm excited to see where this goes. Thank you for being part of this experiment. Uh, it's been a pleasure to have you oh, on, on the I, show. It's been a pleasure getting to know you, Barry, and I'm looking forward to working with you more in the future. Thank you for joining us for this episode of the Unlearn Podcast. Help us get the word out and make this podcast